has been said that leaders are born, not made. Well, I think our next guest may disagree with that. Welcome, Aaron Liefer of the Point Foundation. Thank you so much for having me. Now, the Point Foundation is designed to do just that, train the next generation of LGBT leaders, correct? Indeed, indeed. And, and also, we're really there to further the access to education, higher education for LD, LGBT youth. Um, we provide four main areas of support. Um, you know, mentorship and leadership development are two of them that you kind of hinted at. And then also, we uh, value, obviously, financial support and scholarship at the graduate and undergraduate level. And then we also do uh, community service. So each scholar has to do a community service project every year. Right. So, I mean, it's not just, you know, let a gay thousand flowers bloom. There's work. No. There's work involved here. Oh, a lot of work. A lot of work. And it's not just cutting people a check and saying, here you go, go to school. Right. So it's, um, it's, it's a very involved program. And what we find, actually, a lot of the scholars really get out of it isn't just the money. It's really about the sense of community and the sense mm -hmm. of uh, development that they get from the Point Foundation. That's right. what benefits them the most. And that's why a lot of them stay involved involved in the foundation after they leave, which is really a, one of our major intents as well. Now, the foundation is headquartered in San Francisco, correct? No, it's actually headquartered in Los Angeles. I apologize. So it's headquartered in Los Angeles, but it was founded. Yes, it was founded in the Bay Area. In uh -huh. fact, um, our one of our first selections was uh, in 2002. We had eight scholars in 2002, and it was uh, we held our selections in a very small location, and um, it's certainly grown from there. And we've done selections in San Francisco every year since then, except for this year. It was done in LA because we've continued to grow and mm -hmm. so our offices are Los Angeles and we have a smaller office uh, in New York. So tell me about the founding of the organization. Whose idea was it and how does it continue to grow? It sounds like it's every year gets bigger and bigger and you fund more scholars. Yeah, uh, it does get bigger and bigger. Our founders uh, were um, some successful LGBT uh, business people and they decided that they wanted to further the cause of education and access to education for LGBT youth and they started off by running uh, some they, by advertising and they were weren't sure if they were going to get any submissions and mm -hmm. but sometimes when you when you offer people some money they <laughs> you'll get submissions yeah and, and we got about um, 300 applicants the first year for eight scholarships and now it's grown and we have 80 active scholars and this year we'll have about 200 alumni and what is the criteria for selection um, we uh, we measure them in four areas, basically. We look at, obviously, their leadership experience. That's the biggest. And we look at, you know, what kinds of things have they done, not just participating, but actually running things, leaving a lasting impact. We look at financial need, obviously. Uh, we look at the marginalization they've experienced. So, in fact, you know, a lot of our scholars have been kicked out of their homes. Well, it's funny. I saw something in the, the background on the Point Foundation that, one third of LGBT youth drop out of high school or college. Mm -hmm. They feel a pressure or mm -hmm. a bigotry. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Eight, I mean, it's like 85 percent of stu of gay students have heard the word "gay" used in a very derogatory way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we we live in a bubble here in in the Bay Area and in California, but in especially in other parts of the country, the, the it's a, it's a very real problem that still exists. Mm -hmm. And so um, we get. The, the types of scholars we get are across the board and um, have so, a, a huge uh, diversity of experience. And But we looked at, again, to get back to the criteria, we, we look at that marginalization to see what connection do they have and, you know, how have they overcome those kinds of things and how are they working to overcome those types of things. Right. So now as a kid in Fresno, what <laughs> got you here to San Francisco and what got you interested in the... Uh the Point Foundation and supporting its work? Um, I actually got involved with the foundation. I went to school in Southern California and then moved up here for work. And um, what got me involved, actually, is I've always had a personal interest in community service and giving back to my community. I did that a lot in college. And once I started working, I, I work in corporate America. and But I wanted to feel more connected to my community. And actually, a friend of mine, uh, his, par his partner at the time, was uh, involved with the foundation. In fact, he held uh, one of the positions I hold now. And um, he told me about it and it was just really a great thing because I think access to education and just getting a degree is so critical in this country and I wanted to be a part of that and I started off by just um, providing money and giving what I could and then actually just watching the Point website I looked for there was a volunteer opportunity for application readers and right. I was I was like sign me up and, yeah. and I got involved in the selections process and I've been this was my third year working in selections and it's it's to actually read the applications and then actually interview the candidates this was my first you're doing final selections where you actually do we do the face-to-face -face interview so it's face-to-face -face. it's not just someone sitting on a resume and a picture and saying oh, hi no, no. cut we, me a check we have several cuts we started with 2500 mm -hmm. applicants this year and we got down to in in around 
maybe around 30. Mm -hmm. So it's about a little over. What's the age range? Uh, everything. I mean, it's. I mean, the undergrad. You're generally going to see. Yeah. So it's just a typical undergrad. So it's the undergrad ages. And then you also we also have graduate applicants. Uh -huh. So I mean, you could, to call them kids is not is a so sorry. I know. It's a little disingenuous. I yep. mean, it's easy. I do it too. But um, everyone's a kid when you get to be 50 something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, I mean, we had an undergraduate candidate this year who was. Um, older an mm -hmm. older candidate and right. so we, we really run the gamut and you got you get a lot of returning students too but generally you know you're gonna find undergrads are gonna be seniors in high school and often uh, you get graduates who are have just and finished. you find that some of these applicants uh -huh. come to you because well you know I, I I'm openly gay I want to do something for my community but I don't have the support at home I can't come out at home I mean what, what are the stories that's, behind these? that's a that's a big that's a big case we find that I think it's about 42 percent of LGBT youth find that they have a hard time going to college because they don't have support of their families we uh, again looking at applications I find over and over again these students have they have no support from their parents and it's not necessarily because their parents have rejected them but a lot of times it's because their parents just don't have the money it's right. really expensive and uh, we find that a lot of them have tremendous financial need by the time they even by the time they come to us right now you've got a a raft of supporters, the business community like you, people mm -hmm. around the country, politicians. Mm -hmm. You've also got some big names that used to be in politics mm -hmm. and are now raising money for the Point Foundation. We're, we're very grateful for that. I understand that uh, David Mixner, you know, famous gay friend of Bill, as in Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. is doing a play that is a fundraiser for the Point Foundation. Yeah, he did it in New York uh, recently, and it was a big, a huge success. And uh, lucky for us, he, he's going to be taking it nationally. He's doing a show in LA, and and one here in San um, Francisco. Yeah, right. and um, and then hopefully some other cities as well. Have you seen the play? I have not. So have you met Mr. Mixner yet, or what, what was the, what was the feeling when he came in and said, "Yeah, I'm going to do this for the Point Foundation." Oh, I think I mean we're we're grateful for any kind of a, you know a, so for any support we can get. I mean we've had, uh, like you said, we've had some celebrities. We have two uh, gala events every year. We have one in uh, New York, one in Los Angeles. Um, last year, Lena Dunham was was our big award recipient in New York. This year, it was Jonathan Groff, who was on San Francisco's very own looking. And um, it's always great. I mean, to because of course they they draw a lot of attention to the organization and um, obviously someone who's been such an activist like Ms. Mr. Mixner uh, has it just really it's it's great to benefit from from his celebrity <laughs> yeah yeah not calling them kids but listen to these young people and mm -hmm. of course maybe sometimes they're not so young but mm -hmm. what is the thread that ties these point foundation scholars together b b leaving aside the obvious one they're all gay you know, I've heard people say that gay people gravitate to certain professions because there's something innate mm -hmm. uh, in our community that makes them serve this particular field. What do these scholars bring as openly gay, well, potential educators, mm -hmm. and community activists? Well, certainly that, potential leaders. Uh huh. Um, I, I, I mean, do they come to you and say, I want to go to school because I want to be a Point Foundation board member, I want to be a politician, I want to be a what have you? They dream big. And it's great that they do because we're here to help make those big dreams become possible. Mm -hmm. um, but the common thread, I think, really is a commitment to community and a commitment to giving back. I mean, that's what we're really looking for. We're looking for people. I mean, in our mission statement, we look for people who are going to change society in a really meaningful way. Um, and we're looking for people who aren't just like trying to become, you know, a wealthy doctor or, you know, a successful right. politician. Well, if you're going to be co going to politics. What, what are you going to do with that? Well, right. So when someone comes to you and says, this is why I think you should fund me as a Point Foundation scholar, what mm -hmm. are some of those interactions like? Especially um, the face-to-face. -face. Right. Mean, well, the interactions, really, it's not just about, here's why you should fund me. It's a lot of it. It's, we get a lot of, here's why I want to be part of your community. And because even though a lot of our scholars, I mean, when you're accepting the top 1%, you're getting people who are very, they've accomplished and they're very smart. And it's beyond that, though. These are people who are really exceptional. These are people who, um, have, have, they're, they're, they're good, they're really smart, and they can really do a lot, but we're looking for people who will also benefit from that mentorship and that sense of you know, bringing them, to, bringing them together with other scholars who are, although we're all LGBT, we know the LGBT community is certainly not you know, one monolithic no, thing. It's, yeah. And so 
you I mean we had people just uh, in selections you know recently saying you know this was like the first time I've ever used my real name as a trans person here's the first time I've actually met trans people I mean because you get people again from all sorts of backgrounds and all and how sorts many of states I mean how many states have these scholars oh, come from for anywhere we, we in, in fact we get people as long as they're going to an accredited four-year university in the US so we get people who don't even live in the US sometimes well tell me about, I mean, how, so talk to me about some of the international scholars that come to the Point Foundation. Oh, um, I mean, some of them must come from countries where it's not only just not like cool to be gay, but it's not safe. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I've seen candidates where I mean, you can literally get someone who they started a, um, like a GSA. I mean, a, yeah, a GSA at, at their school in Uganda. I mean, you're just like, oh my God. I mean, sometimes it's it's you know as, as you know, like I said, someone in corporate America reads this. So you look at these applications, you're like, what have I done with my life? Yeah. And and it, but it is so rewarding to feel like. I'm working to further the dreams of these people who are obviously so well-intentioned and so wanting to give back to the community and, mm -hmm. and do these, as I think you were kind of hinting at, hero sometimes heroic things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, they go, they go to the Harvards and the Cornells and the Browns, but then they talk about, well, I want to become a doctor and a lawyer, but then I want to go back to Mississippi and practice in my community. I want to provide medicine that um, is aimed at trans people so they can get the right kind of doctors who understand trans issues. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what we're looking for. So we're looking at people who are, like, to get back to one of your earlier questions, is that they're providing work that's going to give back to the community, often maybe not in the ways you might normally think of in terms of like, you know, just sort of general political activism, but by using their field to support the community right. in, in new ways. Just a few moments left. Let me ask you how this work has impacted you. What have you learned from these young scholars? What um, have you taken back from these interactions back to your corporate America job. And may I ask, what, what is your job? Um, I, yeah, no, you can ask what I do. I work in uh, knowledge management. Actually, I work for, I work for AT&T. Ah, my mother's old company, yeah. <laughs> Breakup of Ma Bell, bad thing. I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> worst thing that ever happened. It's a great place So to work. what have you learned from these young people that you've taken back to AT&T? What can AT&T learn from these young people? Um, I've really learned a sense of, of creating community, a really a sense of wanting to go beyond just the work and to see, you know, what's the larger picture and what, what are we really doing? And it's, it's so it's just really empowering work. I mean, I mean, when I like when I finished with selections that, that recently, I couldn't wait to go do it again. I'd worked eight hours a day, you know, ten hours a day on a weekend, and every day I was like exhausted but exhilarated at yeah. the same time. So it just to feel like you're doing the good work. It it just it's powerful, and you get it. You get it from the, the candidates and the scholars because they're the ones telling you, they're like, even just being an applicant has changed my life. It's right. made me want to redouble my work. How can you not walk away from that feeling just exhilarated and amazing? Great. Thanks for your work. Thank you so much. Next up, we will learn why Dante's work is really hell. We're going to learn all about Club Inferno from one of its actors. We'll be right back. Thanks.